So hello everyone. Hello everyone. My name is Michel and thank you very much for joining us today to listen to Dr. Alfonso Pazano on the topic of DBS, focus ultrasound and infusion pumps and how these technologies can help people with Parkinson's. Dr. Fasano is professor of neurology at the University of Toronto and one of the world leaders in deep brain stimulation. I would like to remind everyone that this session is for information and education purposes only. So as I've told you many times before, if you're seeking medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, you should really consult a medical professional, but you know that. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You can enter your questions at any, any, moment, any moment from now already or during the, the Q&A session itself. Please be aware that Dr. Fasano has a hard stop in 90 minutes due to patient engagements, but frankly, that gives us plenty of time. So for those of you who don't know us yet, No Silver Bullet is a Parkinson support group managed by Mark Lambert and myself. And we really want to help you to become well-informed journalists in your condition and to make informed choices on how to adapt your lifestyle to slow down disease progression. We are organizing Zoom sessions with researchers and PD specialists to update you on the latest advances in science and medicine, but also in nutrition, in exercise and wellness. We post, as you all know, the recordings of our sessions on YouTube and on Spotify, and I invite you please to subscribe to those channels so that you are informed when we post new material and new content. The details of the channels are available in the chat section at the bottom of your screen. Let's come back to today's topic and to Dr. Alfonso Fasano, who will talk to us about DBS, focused ultrasound and infusion pumps. Alfonso, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for the kind invitation, the introduction, and uh, to all the participants uh, for spending their afternoon with me. Here in Toronto, it's uh, 11 a.m. and we're about to get a big snowstorm, uh, so we're going to be stuck probably in office for a while. But as you mentioned, I'm, I'm seeing patients, so uh, I, unfortunately, we'll have a hard stop in an hour and a half from now, but I said we're going to have plenty of time to cover this uh, very interesting topic. Uh, that is the use of technology, in other words, uh, to help Parkinson's disease. Um, I know that uh, there's a chat function at the bottom of the screen where you can ask questions. There's a Q&A actually function. Uh, so I'll be happy to uh, address your questions. Uh, this presentation that I, I'm sure you're gonna be able to see now <clears throat> is really meant to set the stage so that you can uh, have an idea, not just about what these technologies are, uh, but also what a neurologist um, keeps in mind when selecting candidates and, and how to choose one versus another. Uh, so uh, I uh, want to, uh, before starting, I just want to say that I have few financial disclosures. I led it, the company that I've been working with as consultant or for research. And these are the companies who are interested in the, in the, the topics that are going to cover today. Uh, I don't think for this audience, this is really needed, but this is just a, once again, to set the stage. Uh, what we do at this point in the treatment of Parkinson's when we use technology is really meant to address what you see in this uh, slide, the motor fluctuation. So people that swing from having no motor at all, the motor control at all with a tremor, dystonia, and, and then uh, uh, when they are on levodopa, they can move, but they have these kinesias. And this happens many times during the day, uh, depending on how many doses the patient takes. Uh, and sometimes just adjusting medications is enough, but sometimes it's not. So this is what we want to see when we consider these options. We want to see, uh, as you see here in this slide, uh, a diagnosis of Parkinson's, motor fluctuations and or these kinesias, the quality of life is impaired because of these problems, and these problems are no longer well controlled with oral drugs. Um, as you see here, this already introduces some issue because uh, these drugs, you know, drugs for Parkinson's are not, are not away, uh, available everywhere in the world with the same uh, types. So saying when a medication is optimized also depends on the knowledge of the neurologist, where the patient lives, what the patient can tolerate. So it's a very fluid definition. And that's why this is something that needs to be uh, considered by a movement disorder specialist. Uh, another thing that I want to highlight here is the disease duration longer than four years. This used to be an, uh, a, a criterion in the past. We don't look at it too much anymore, but I will also argue that if someone with Parkinson's disease reaches the level to require advanced therapies in four years, 
from disease onset, there are two options. One, that's not Parkinson's disease. Uh, some people with multiple system atrophy were mistakenly diagnosed with Parkinson's and they underwent these procedures, particularly DDS, and that can make things worse. So if the disease is fast progressive, uh, progressing, Parkinson's might not be the right diagnosis. Second, and this is what happens more often, if you have Parkinson's for four years or less and you're really looking into this therapy, chances are that your disease started a lot earlier and it just, it just got diagnosed much later. That's why it looks like a short disease. And that's, as I said, the most common situation. There are also exclusion criteria, like a short lifespan, other major problems that are impeding quality of life, because obviously doing this a treatment is not going to fix everything. Uh, and controlled depression basically means being a risk for suicide. Depression is common, but it can be treated. And being depressed is not an exclusion criterion. We just want to make sure that the depression is well controlled and there's no risk of suicide. And then we can do these things. Uncontrolled psychosis means that even with a, a, an antipsychotic, there are still hallucinations, delusions. Again, hallucinations, particularly the visual ones, are common in Parkinson's, but they are well managed. So that is not a contraindication uh, when it's well managed. Uh, dementia is something that happens, especially when there are uncontrolled psychosis, because it means that the cortex is not working properly. And it's an exclusion criteria for two reasons. First, because the quality of life here is majorly, it's a major determinant of quality of life impairment. It comes from dementia, not from the motor problems. So fixing the motor problems, it won't, it, that won't help dementia. Uh, and secondly, because especially neurosurgical approaches uh, can make things worse. So in dementia, the brain is frail. And if we do an intervention in the brain, that these things can get even worse. There are other criteria that we look at, uh, like a very good response to levodopa, and that's really helping us decide when to go ahead or not. This in general, with the exception of uh, dyskinesias, of course, because dyskinesias are actually worsened by levodopa, and, and that's not a problem. Actually, most of what we do helps dyskinesias. Uh, and more importantly, tremor. Tremor might be levodopa resistant, but even if your tremor doesn't respond well to levodopa, we can still consider these options, particularly the neurosurgical ones. The neurosurgery works for tremor way more than medications and pumps. Patient's motivation, that's very important. And that's why I like to do seminars like the one I'm doing right now. Because if patient is aware, if patient is motivated, uh, this uh, drives the doctor to do better and more. Uh, being motivated doesn't mean, however, being uh, having excessive expectations. This is not a cure. Whatever we do here is not, unfortunately, a cure. It's just a treatment. And some patients don't understand that resulting in disappointment after surgery. And last but not least, supportive entourage. So a good caregiver, care partner, a good family. This is something we look at all the time because without support, even from a nurse in a nursing home, for example, it's difficult to implement these technologies because they require some work. Uh, a good way to look at things is to consider the five to one criteria. So we start looking into this anytime the patient is taking at least five doses of levodopa, there is at least two hours of off time a day, and there's at least one hour of troublesome dyskinesias. Now, off time a day, you know, it can be just a little bit at night, in the morning, even if it's two hours, but it's mild, it doesn't necessarily mean much. And same for dyskinesias. Dyskinesias need to be troublesome because if, if you have some dyskinesias and it's not a big deal, you don't have to look into these things. But this five to one rule is just a rule of thumb, something that we uh, tell family doctors, general neurologists, patients themselves to keep in mind. This doesn't mean that you need to go for one of these procedures, but it tells you, okay, when this is going on, five, two, one, start thinking about it. Um, and what are these advanced treatment? In this slide, you see them summarized. Deep brain stimulation is a brain pacemaker, and I also include in this other neurosurgical procedures like focus to ultrasound. Subcutaneous apomorphin, which is a pump infusing uh, a dopamine agonist called apomorphin, and that's available in many countries in Europe, in the States, not quite yet. In Canada, it's not available. And the other one is the pump giving levodopa, carbidopa in the gut. This is a busy slide, but this is 
again, what we keep in mind when we decide. So step one is, is this patient a good patient for an advanced therapy? If the answer is yes, we move to step two. Step two is, okay, what do we do then? Do we do DBS, ablation? Ablation is still a neurosurgical procedure whereby we destroy a part of the brain. LCIG means levodopa, carbidopa, intestinal gel. It's known as duodopa in most of the world. In the States, it's called duopa. CSAI stands for continuous subcutaneous apomorphin infusion. It's the same pump I told you before. So for DBS, we want to see a few things. You know, if tremor is resistant to levodopa, either DBS or ablation is something to consider, as well as brittle response to levodopa. So there are some people very sensitive to levodopa. Even a little bit of it causes massive dyskinesias, and that's exactly what we uh, look for when we consider neurosurgical treatments, either DBS or ablation. Um, uh, autonomy needs in DBS. These DBS devices are inserted in the body. It's all inside. You don't have to go around with pumps, cassettes. So that's something that favors DBS. And that's why we tend to do DBS, especially in young patients, for the same reason as steady consideration. Another important one is nocturnal akinesia. So when there's slowness at night, because DBS works 24 seven, as opposed to pumps that only work when the pump is connected. There are specific exclusion criteria, risk of suicide, bad depression, bad apathy, especially when we lower medication, when these things can get worse. Uh, and also uh, very important to realize that these are interventions with high risk. DBS is a, is a brain operation. There's a 1% risk of a stroke, 5% risk of an infection. So if the patient or the brain is frail, uh, we don't want to do that. Ablation, as you can see, very often has the same supporting uh, criteria, but there are a few things to keep in mind. With ablation, there is nothing left in the body. So it's actually pretty nice uh, because the patient doesn't need to have any checking of the system, no programming. So it's especially important for people living far from uh, tertiary centers or for people with very asymmetric disease. That's because ablation is typically done on one side only of the brain because it would be too dangerous to do a permanent ablation in the brain on both sides. Uh, and for the same reason, you see why this is an exclusion criteria. Uh, long lifespan is an exclusion criteria for ablation because if you're supposed to live 40, 50 years, then it makes sense to do DBS because DBS can be adjusted over time. With ablation, it's a one-shot procedure. You get what you get. Uh, as for the pumps, levodopa or apomorphin, uh, this is when, uh, for the case, the case of uh, levodopa pump, what you want to simplify the therapy, the oral therapy. Um, DDS means dopamine dysregulation syndrome. These are people addicted to levodopa in whom you can reduce levodopa. In these people, I would still consider probably DBS to at least get rid of dyskinesia as, as a good option. Swallowing impairment, because in levodopa carbidopa intestinal gel, we use a, a, a G2. So if you need to have a G2, for other reasons, you can kill two birds with one stone. Some people are afraid of neurosurgery, and these are good options. There are exclusion criteria. So uh, one of them is dyskinesias. If dyskinesias are a big problem, we know that this is happening because of levodopa. And if you use levodopa as an infusion pump, yes, things can do better initially, but over the years, you may still have dyskinesias. Problems at night, because unless you use the pump for 24 hours, uh, you won't do well at night. Uh, there are a few other exclusion criteria, but we can skip that. As for apomorphine pump, here you need to realize that this is a dopamine agonist. And as such, uh, you may expect that side effects of dopamine agonist, hallucinations, confusion, mania, impulse control disorders. Um, but uh, for the same reason, this is a good drug to treat depression, apathy, because that's something that dopamine agonists do very well. Uh, the other thing I want to emphasize is the apomorphine pumps. It, 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 the apomorphine pump is easy to be implemented. It doesn't require any major surgery. It is a needle under the skin. So it can be tried for a month, see what happens. Or it can be tried for a couple of years. And then when you're not happy about it anymore, you just remove it. Um, and because of what I mentioned already, uh, you understand why psychosis or ICD are contraindication, as well as advanced age. I should also mention that... Uh, Apomorphine has nothing to do with morphine. Some people get confused, they think it's the same thing, but there is some similarity in the structure. So if you're allergic to morphine, which is rare, is also a contraindication to apomorphine.
So let's have a look at uh, this therapy one by one. Apomorphin can be used in two different ways. It can be used as a pen jet kind of thing, uh, like an EpiPen, just to revert off symptoms because apomorphin is quite strong and it works in 10, 15 minutes. But in this context, we're talking about this, what you see on the right, which is a small pump, like an insulin pump, giving you this molecule constantly for all the time you have the pump on, usually during the day. Although there is a new study only using it at night. Um, I already mentioned that, especially in old patients, there can be confusion. And this video that a patient happened to see in the, OR, in the eMERGE one day also shows this, another big problem that apomorphin can cause over the years, which are these skin nodules. Uh, because, you know, day by day, infusion, infusing this product under the skin can irritate the skin a little bit. But in a young patient instead, you can actually use uh, apomorphin as the only therapy. The skin tolerates the, uh, the procedure very well. And in this case, for example, this young man is using apomorphine alone with nothing else. So everything is done by the pump. And that's possible because uh, at this age, the pump is tolerated and we can use high dose and therefore get rid of the other drugs and therefore also improve the dyskinesias. Over time, however, we'll still need, need to use higher dose, maybe levodopa. And we, in this paper, found out that is not the problems that I mentioned so far, the major reason for discontinuing the apomorphin, but it's the problem with dyskinesias. But the apomorphin can be started, as I said, very soon. It's easy to start. So many people argue that apomorphin pump can be used in the meantime uh, while waiting for something else. And if DBS is needed or uh, levodopa intestinal gel is needed, you stop the pump with apomorphin and you do the other things. Uh, how about the other pump I mentioned, levodopa, carbidopa, intestinal gel? This is how the pump looks like. It's a really big pump. The first part is the computer that uh, the neurologist programs uh, with the different doses that the patient is supposed to take. The second part is the cassette containing levodopa. It contains two grams of levodopa, which means uh, like having uh, 20 tablets of levodopa, carbidopa, 100 over 25. Or, or in case you are familiar with Madopar, it will be uh, 10 tablets of the Madopar 200 over 50. So it's a good amount of levodopa. Um, it's a pump, that's why it works. It constantly infuses this product uh, in the body. But the other reason it works is because it's not just uh, delivering levodopa in the stomach, it's actually delivering levodopa in the duodenum, or actually after the duodenum, in the jejunum. This is the part of the small intestine where levodopa is absorbed. So it's causing infusion, also delivered where it's supposed to be delivered. So bypassing the stomach. Uh, there are two ways to uh, use this pump. The first way is through a naso uh, jejunal tube. And this is only for a couple of weeks max. And that's a test. It, it is to see whether the patient does better, if the patient is happy with the pump. Because if things do well, then the gastroenterologist will place the G-tube and that's the, the final procedure. In some centers, like in Toronto, we don't do the test phase too much anymore because we know when the patient is good. We do it when we are not sure if it's gonna help or when the patient is not sure if we want to have the pump. So this is an easy way to have a glimpse of what this can do for you. I don't live for yesterday. I don't live for next week. I live for the moment right now. I live for now. And it was, what's going to happen is going to take care of itself, I think. Uh, I, can't, I can't change. I don't know what's going to happen. We're hoping for some improvement so we can get back to doing some things that we used to be able to do and also that he's hoping that he can get rid of some of these pills. He's up to 33 pills a day now. The surgery was uh, fairly straightforward. I didn't have any pain before or after. It's healed, as they predicted, in the three-week period after the surgery. I feel so much more liberated, absolutely. Not just because he can do the pump by himself, but all the other things that he can do by himself. Make his own lunch, he can dress himself. And I thought, yes. <laughs> So this video you just saw um, describes the story of a patient of ours uh, and his wife, uh, and it's called The Little Things, uh, and just a part of it is a nice short movie on the story of this couple. 
and how liquid opaque IBO of intestinal gel helped them. And I wanted you to, to see it. Uh, this is another uh, gentleman I happened to follow when I was practicing in Italy, younger patient with a lot of tablets plus apomorphine injections. And, and you will see on the left how he was doing without uh, medication. So he will have veer off uh, periods with anxiety attacks, panic attacks, many times a day, in spite of all these tablets. And on the right, you see how he did right after we started the, the pump, uh, he can move, uh, he stopped all the drugs except the medication for the sleep. Uh, and he did much better, as you can tell from the video, with no dyskinesias. And at some point, it's going to also show in the video, uh, no, I think it's not showing it, the, uh, how the pump looks like on his belly. So what are the contraindications that uh, we didn't address yet? Um, well, uh, some of these contraindications are actually not relevant because these are basically the contraindication to levodopa. But if someone gets this therapy, it means that he, this person had already been on levodopa from before. So there are very few contraindications for um, uh, levodopa, carbidopa, intestinal gel. One that is important to remember are the contraindications related to the PEG placement. So there are more gastrointestinal issues like problems with the gastric wall, uh, acute illness of the intestine, um, like peritonitis or pancreatitis. So there are some situations, thankfully rare, where we cannot do the G2. And this is when levodopacarbidopa intestinal gel is not a good option. Uh, this is a new treatment that is probably going to be available to you uh, in a couple of years, Max. Uh, this is similar to the apomorphine pump but it doesn't give you epomorphine, it gives you levodopa. Uh, so it's basically the combination of the levodopa intestinal gel pump, sort of, and the epomorphine, meaning levodopa, better tolerated, meaning no need to have a G2. It's a subcutaneous infusion for 24 hours. Um, and uh, as sh shown in this study, uh, when the people are on this therapy, as opposed to the oral drug, the on time increases and the off time decreases, and is also shown by the modern diary. See, the green part is the on time without these kinesias. Uh, now, let's switch gear and let's talk about neurosurgery. Even though we're going to be focusing on deep brain stimulation and MRI guided focused ultrasound, I need you to realize that there are actually four types of surgery. The very first neurosurgical procedures ever done for movement disorders is called radio frequency lesioning. And it consisted in inserting a probe in the brain, use that probe to make sure that we are in the right spot, stimulating the brain, recording in the brain. And then, and this is all in local anesthesia, use that probe to burn the area. So it's a way to do an ablation going inside the brain. So it's very precise, it's very well known because it's been around for many years. We still do it in some cases. Um, and this is when you probably heard about thalamotomy, pallidotomy. When we talk about standard thalamotomy, standard pallidotomy, this is what we talk about. We talk about lesioning the thalamus or the pallidum using the radio frequency probe. Deep brain stimulation, as you probably realize, it's something that's been around for over three decades. It's a brain pacemaker. It requires general anesthesia, but there is no ablation. So there is no, that's the only one of this whole procedure that doesn't imply uh, an irreversible killing on neurons. Um, gamma knife radiosurgery, it's another way, minimally invasive, to kill neurons, but it doesn't use ultrasound, it uses radiation. We tend, no, we tend not to use it anymore, uh, not too much at least, for two reasons. Uh, first, the effect is not immediate, because radiation takes some time to kill the neurons. Second, because it uses radiation, and we're trying to stay away from radiation. However, it still has a role in some patients particularly in people on blood thinners who can't stop the blood thinners. So this is a more gentle way to do a lesion and these people cannot, uh, don't have to stop the blood thinners. And finally, MRI guided focus ultrasound is a new procedure that we have out of these four. So the experience is limited. It's quite uh, interesting and promising. And we will basically use ultrasound that are shot through the skull to burn the neurons. So it's inducing a lesion so it's, again, uh, an irreversible treatment, uh, but it's doing it without opening the skull with immediate effect. We can see the effect even when the patient is still in the uh, operating uh, procedure area that is basically a, an MRI suite. Uh, so you see in this table the comparison between these four um, procedures. 
Um, and uh, again, the only invasive, uh, the invasive ones are radiofrequency lesioning and deep brain stimulation. The minimal invasive is gamma knife and focus ultrasound. They, all of them are irreversible with the exception of deep brain stimulation. Uh, the one using general anesthesia is only deep brain stimulation. The one possible for bilateral problems is deep brain stimulation. The, all the other ones are only possible for one side, even though we are now starting to do bilateral focus ultrasound procedure, but that's mainly for research. Uh, so let's say we decide to do neurosurgery. Step three is what target to go to, because either you go for DBS or an ablation, and the ablation can be done with radiofrequency lesioning, with focus ultrasound, or with gamma knife, you need to decide where to do the procedure. And these are the three major targets. Sutalamus, globus pallidus, or, or, or VIM, which is a thalamic target. VIM only works for tremor. So we only do it in people who cannot do the other two procedure uh, and they are impaired by tremor mainly. The good thing is that it's relatively safe uh, and it can be done in any age basically. But for most Parkinson's patients, we consider STN or GPI. STN is the one, is the strongest we have. It mimics the effect of levodopa. It's possibly superior to levodopa in terms of tremor reduction, but it's the most dangerous because the stimulation of the subthalamus can make speech balance and gait worse, can cause impulsivity, uh, can, can lead to depression if we lower the medication too, too much or too fast. So whenever possible, we try to do STN DBS but it's a little difficult to do it in some patients and it can cause problems. GPI is also quite effective. It's less powerful than sutalamic stimulation, but it's safer. That's why we tend to do this in people who are not good candidates for sutalamic stimulation. This is where these nuclei are in the brain. Again, thalamus for tremor mainly, including Parkinson's tremor. Sutalamus improves all the major problems of Parkinson's that you see here listed, including dyskinesias because we lower medications. GPI reduces most of the problems of Parkinson's, is more effective than sutalamus in reducing dystonia, especially when dystonia is non levodopa responsive. Uh, it is more effective than sutalamic stimulation in improving dyskinesias because even though we don't reduce medications with GPI stimulation, we can actually improve dyskinesias uh, simply stimulating this target. And as I mentioned already, is safer than subthalamic stimulation. So this is um, a thalamotomy done with focus ultrasound. So in this picture here on the left, this is the MRI, and this is where the lesion happens, is how we cook this part of the brain with ultrasound. It's like you put your brain in a microwave oven and you cook this part of the brain focusing these waves in that particular spot. This is the thalamus, the VIM in a patient with tremor. And I put here next to this picture, the, the CAT scan of another patient who had a radiofrequency thalamotomy in the thalamus. That's why you see this hole many years before. And then since he needed something else done on the other side, as you heard already, ablation is not safe to be done on both sides. That's why he underwent DBS. And the electrode was once again placed in the same part of the, re, uh, the brain, the thalamus, which is also targeted here in this other example with focus ultrasound. This is an animation to show you how it works. The patient has to be fully shaved because the hair don't really help the transmission of the waves. It's, the head is placed in a special helmet with all water around, and that's to cool the skin so that the skin doesn't uh, hit, is not eaten up by the uh, ultrasound. And over a thousand transducers are shooting very mild uh, uh, waves of ultrasound, but they all together converge in the spot that we're cooking, we're thermocoagulating, we're lesioning with thermic energy. In, in, in the example I just made, it was the thalamus. And the patient is awake, no general anesthesia. This is Professor Obeso in Madrid that assesses the patient in DOR. We can also monitor the procedure using MRI, and the MRI can also tell us the temperature in each part of the brain. And, and we do sonication, so small increase of temperature without killing anything, just to see what happens to the patient, if there are side effects, if the tremor improves, if the movement improves, the rigidity improves, and right after the procedure, the patient is doing better. Uh, I already mentioned the thalamus as one of the targets. Here, just to say that we also now doing pallidotomy, 
Uh, so also ad addressing the global spallage sparse interna with focus ultrasound. The same can be done, as you heard already, with DBS. And this is how it looks like. It's a brain pacemaker with wires run, uh, uh, running out of the skin. These wires go inside the brain and stimulate different parts of the brain. And these are connected to a battery that is under the collarbone. Uh, what are the indications of DBS? Many. Today, today we're going to talk about Parkinson's disease, but it's also widely used for other movement disorders. And there are many new uh, expanding new indications. This is a procedure that is going up in an exponential uh, way. These are numbers in the States alone since 2011. And the major uh, indication remains Parkinson's disease. The green uh, la uh, line is the one driving this exponential growth. DBS is also expanding worldwide. Many, many more countries now are offering this procedure to their patients. Unfortunately, we are still not doing a good job in serving certain areas of the world. And also in some other areas of the world, like South America or China or India, unfortunately, this is not covered by a public system or insurance system. And so people, unfortunately, need to pay this expensive procedure out of their pocket. In the past, we were very strict in selecting STN DBS candidates. Sutalamic candidate, as I mentioned already, sutalamic is a strong target, but we need to be careful. And back in those days, we were having a lot of uh, contraindication or in we were very strict. And in this publication, they, these authors said that basically only uh, 1.6 people of their outpatients clinic could really fulfill the criteria for STN DBS can, um, procedures. But if they were losing up a little bit their criteria, this would go up to five. Nowadays, we say that this is above 10, even 20%, because we are now removing some of these barriers. We are learning more and more about DBS. So we're more keen in offering the procedure, and also we're doing it earlier. So this is part of the reason we do this earlier. Uh, I'm sure you all are familiar with the debate of whether levodopa is toxic, needs to be used, not used. We now know that levodopa is safe to use. It can be used as soon as possible, obviously at the lowest possible dose, because the more levodopa you take, the more discrepancies you will have in the future. But um, in any case, uh, in this simulation here, the others are decided to are shown that if you delay therapy, you just suffer more. And then when you start the therapy, you still have these conditions and fluctuations. If you start with dopamine agonists, yes, you won't have fluctuations these conditions for a long time. But dopamine agonists are not the greatest at treating Parkinson's and they cause side effects. And then eventually when you start levodopa, you still see fluctuations in these conditions. So these others have argued that it doesn't matter. And you can start levodopa right away. This reduces this disability over time. And yes, you will have uh, uh, fluctuations, dyskinesias, possibly a little earlier than dopamine agonists. But in the end, what they are saying here that five, six years later, you are in a situation where probably you are considering uh, an advanced therapy. So this is how the landscape of PD therapy has changed. In this paper, however, we make the point that, okay, let's see what happens waiting a little longer. If you wait a little longer, seven, eight years, yes, you really need to do one of the advanced therapy. But depending on the starting age, you may end up doing different things. Because if you are talking about an early onset Parkinson's disease, by the time you need something, you can use anything. Possibly STN-DBS is the right thing to do. Maybe you can start with an epimorphin pump and then do STN. But if you are 65, 70, when you're diagnosed and you, you follow this line, by the time you need an advanced therapy, STN-DBS or apomorphine are, are a no-go because it's too dangerous. And you have the other options that I discussed uh, today, particularly GPI-DBS or levodopa carbidopa intestinal gel. Part of the reason we favor STN-DBS in young patients is because with you probably realize that medications are needed to move, but also to improve apathy, cognition, but too much doesn't help. Makes behavior worse, hallucination, also cognition worsens. worsens. And DBS, especially done early, allows a medication reduction and medications can be increased over, over the following years. I wanna show you a DBS patient now. This is a woman uh, in her 70. Uh, she was having a tremor uh, with more levodopa. The tremor went away, but she started to have involuntary movements of the leg that is called by facing dyskinesias. This goes away, increasing the amount of levodopa. But with more levodopa, she had more dyskinesias. And it was difficult to fine tune the situation. And eventually, she underwent GPI-DBS, even though she was uh, 
she was um, uh, um, in her advanced age, um, she was uh, able to receive this procedure with no problems. And, uh, and she was uh, doing fairly well, as you can tell. And you, she can also lower the medications, which is something we don't usually see in GPI DBS. Programming, as I said already, uh, is a challenge. Some people living far from our centers don't, can't, can't have extensive programming, and that's big of a problem. But technology is helping now. We have now systems to do remote programming. For example, we are now doing programming in people living in Newfoundland, which is an island that is three, four hours from Toronto by flight, or this other patient of ours who lives in Trinidad, we're able to program her from afar. And this is just to make the point that technology is helping us more and more as we move forward. However, technology also comes with a lot of expectations and a lot of placebo. And when I talk to patients, I always make the point that you need to be careful of what you read on the internet. On the internet, there is a lot of fake news. Please be careful and always rely to what your doctor tells you. This is a woman who was featured in Australia where she was using any sort of neuromodulation device and she was doing much, much better as a miracle. This is all placebo. Keep this in mind because otherwise you're gonna be fooled uh, and you're gonna spend money and eventually you're gonna be disappointed. I also want you to uh, hear and the story of, of um, uh, these Benj patients of mine, Benjamin Stetcher. Benjamin is a role model for all of you. He's a young onset Parkinson's disease patient who has a very successful blog called uh, Tomorrow Edition. Check him out on Twitter, LinkedIn, social media, and also on his blog, because he describes his journey in the disease, but also where research is going. And he recently underwent DBS, and he was quite vocal about DBS, and he wanted everybody to know about it, not because everybody needs to have DBS, but because he wanted to uh, help people considering this procedure uh, go ahead and have the information that they want to receive. Uh, and in his blog, he also described how the procedure uh, was for him while he was awake in the OR. He was pretty excited about it, uh, but not every patient is excited about it. Some people actually describe these parts of the procedure as terrifying, uh, but obviously everybody is different. Uh, but I think it's important to share. It's important to share your story, to help each other. And we are all aligned here. So doctors, patients need to be part of the same team, but also patient with patient need to team up uh, to uh, uh, really improve the journey in this disease. And, and this is uh, from his uh, blog when he's describing his procedure. And actually, Ben and I are now working together on a, on a book. We are writing a book on the experience of DBS, the experience of our relationship, and hopefully you'll see this book uh, in, uh, uh, in a bookstore in, in a year from now, hopefully. Uh, so the final step is when to do these things. And this is easy now. It used to be a debate. We now know that if your quality of life is impaired by fluctuations and or dyskinesia, and if fluctuations and or dyskinesia are not well managed with drugs, there is no reason to wait. You just go ahead, talk to your doctor, and you go for one of the procedures that I met so far, and how to decide what target, for example, depends on the many things I told you during this, this webinar. And this is shown by papers like this one. This is the early steam trial, where people in these situations went for DBS or best medical therapy. And this uh, paper nicely shows that quality of life improves very fast and remains improved over time, while with best medical therapy, quality of life doesn't improve. And, and this is probably the most important message I want to give you today. So unfortunately, Parkinson's cannot be stopped. There is a motor worsening over time, but the brain and the human beings are extremely resilient and they can adapt. I'm amazed by the way uh, people with Parkinson's and their family manage to adapt in a very creative way. And every story of my patient is so inspiring. Ben is one of them, but there are many more. Adaptation is in place all the time and people find different ways to adapt. They don't go to work anymore, they work from home. They don't go to a restaurant anymore, they invite friends over. But at some point the motor condition and particularly the fluctuations and these conditions can be so bad that, that you lose the adaptation. Uh, you lose your job, you lose your spouse, you lose your friend. And if you do one of these advanced therapies that I mentioned today here, yes, you're gonna have a better motor control but it's difficult to go back. It's difficult to get married again or to go back to your ex or to you know, go back to work. So the goal 
of your neurologist, but also your goal in a way is to inform the neurologist so that you tell them how your life, not just your motor problem, but your life in general, your psychosocial adaptation is going because the goal is to do surgery at this point, because this will result into yes, motor improvement, but this will in turn also improve your social uh, condition. And with this, uh, once again, I wanna thank, thank you all for being with me for the invitation. And uh, last but not least, I really wanna help the many people, Toronto Western here in Canada, helping me uh, in this uh, program. Uh, I mentioned already the value of the team, and medicine nowadays is not possible without a great team. All we do requires so many different expertises that you really need to work with a, with a variety of very smart, clever, and motivated people. Uh, these are just one of them, and uh, one the, the, I'm, I'm honored to work with every day, and I want to thank them all once again, as I always do at the end of my presentation. And down there, you can also see my Twitter account in case you want to follow me on social media. Thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions now. Thank you very much, Alfonso. I think this was highly informative and also extremely candid as the feedback from Benjamin has shown us or, or taking into account the psychosocial condition, as you mentioned. So thank you very much for the, that multidimensional approach to the presentation and not purely scientific or medical. Um, we can look at the questions together if you want. I know you're very familiar sure. with them. Uh, I think the first one that I see here uh, is uh, from Matt Eagles. Matt Eagles actually is well known to me because he's uh, an amazing gentleman who was diagnosed with Parkinson's when he was seven or eight years old. Um, and he's now, uh, has had it for 40 years or so, if I remember properly. Um, mm -hmm. He's asking us if there is a, a finite time that you know of, yeah. the, of that BBS will remain effective for. So is it good for life or do we need to change something? Yeah. Well, I understand why this question comes from him, uh, given um, you know, what he's going through. Um, uh, it's obviously a, a difficult uh, answer to give because uh, we're we're learning day by day. Basically, the procedure, uh, the first DBS procedure, was done in 1979, the way we know it now in our in our patient in Germany with uh, tremor um, because and dystonia because of multiple sclerosis. So we always say you know it started in Grenoble in France, but in reality it was done much earlier. And it, it, the the Grenoble team has two major um, uh, merits. The first one is that they identified the sotalamus as the major target. Second is that they really um, modified the DBS uh, workflow the way we know it today. So they started the, the DBS era the way we know it today. Uh, but let's say we, we, we assume that DBS became a reality at the end of the 80s. Uh, yeah, we have three decades or more of experience. And the answer I'm going to give you is based on what I've seen over the uh, three decades. I, I'm 45 years old, by the way, and I saw my first DBS patient when I was 20. And it's part of the reason I went to, into neurology. I was a student, a medical student, and I saw the first STN DBS patients done in, in, in my hospital in Rome. And I was blown away by the technology, by what I could see with my eye. And, um, and so I've been seeing DBS uh, patients for quite some time now. And I can tell you that it works for life for certain problems. Uh, if you're talking about tremor, fluctuations, dyskinesis, rigidity, it works for life. But if the disease is meant to cause dementia, memory problems, depression, balance problems, freezing of gait, and those problems are levodopa resistant, DBS is not gonna help. So it works for life, but for the problems that we know are levodopa responsive. That's the short answer. Thank you very much. Question from Harry. He's asking, whether well, you have any thoughts on whether newer techniques such as directional leads or closed loop DBS can reduce uh, adverse effects such as speech issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the, um, the, uh, this is a very important question. Uh, and I just touched upon it when I described the remote programming. That was just for me to say that technology is, is constant evolution. At this point, we can say the standard of care in DBS is uh, directional leads. Um, uh, 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 the directional lead means that we can steer electricity around the electrode and, and we can avoid certain side effects caused by stimulation. There are many other new features and one of them is for sure adaptive stimulation, which means, uh, uh, um, uh, which means it's, a, um, uh, it's a adjusting automatically, it's a closed loop stimulation. 
because we now have a better sense of what the brain does during certain moments. And these devices are able to record the brain, understand what's going on and adjust the stimulation depending on the uh, specific algorithm that is implemented by the doctor. Uh, so this is very interesting, very promising. Uh, and I think it's gonna be uh, practice, um, common practice in a year from now, more or less. So we are not far away. Actually in some countries like in Japan, uh, DBS uh, devices with adaptive features are already commercialized. And many of the DBS devices that we're implanting these days are, uh, are um, uh, already, already, already have this feature, the adaptive features embedded, but for safety reasons, this feature is locked. So we're waiting for studies to prove safety and efficacy so that these features can be unlocked. So in one shot, a lot of people will go from standard stimulation to adaptive stimulation. But to respond to, to, uh, to reply to the question of whether this is making things safer, I would say absolutely yes, but safer only in, in, in reducing the side effects caused by stimulation. For example, if you have a bleeding because of the insertion of the electrode, that is not gonna change uh, because you have directional lead or adaptive stimulation. These technologies are making stimulation safer with respect to the stimulation related side effects. And that's a given for sure. Thank you very much. I see a question from Sue, uh, which I, I would say, Sue, we exchanged a few emails before. It's a rather personal question. Um, I, I would just suggest that actually, I, I have copied your question, Sue, and I will send an email to Dr. Fasano afterwards, um, because she's asking uh, for advice as to how to be referred to you by her existing specialist. I think that this is probably just a, such a specific question. I don't really want to, to answer yeah, it online. So I hope you will understand that. Uh, Matt has another question. He's asking whether uh, it is true that apomorphine can have Viagra-like effects in man, but not when required or wanted. Another good question from Matt. Yes, it's true. And actually, I've been saying that perhaps uh, apomorphine uh, should be favored in people with um, erectile dysfunction. Erectile dysfunction can be seen in Parkinson's uh, as a result of this autonomia. And apomorphine is used by andrologists and urologists to treat uh, uh, erectile dysfunction. Uh, but Matt is right. Sometimes uh, you might have an unwanted um, uh, erection, uh, and sometimes this can be a prolonged and painful erection. It's called priapism. Uh, it's a rare set of effects, but this is, it is possible. The flip side of it is that, in theory, apomorphine can help erectile dysfunction if there is erectile dysfunction. So, okay, so it, it was true. Another question from Harry, uh, apologizing for the fact that it's a bit technical, but he basically says, should there be much difference in changing DBS from voltage-based to amperage-based amplitude? He understands that one of the newer devices from Medtronic, Percept, uses solely amps-based amplitude. Yeah, that's a, a seemingly difficult question. It's actually pretty simple. So when we deliver electricity, we can deliver it as a form of uh, tension, so we say volts or current. In the end, whatever we do, it is current that is delivered to the brain. So for this reason, all the new technologies are, uh, are now looking at current uh, constant systems. So we don't look at volts anymore, we look at milliampere, which is fine, it's probably better. Uh, the only issue um, is when someone is using a, a voltage-based system, the battery dies and the patient receives a new battery, it is only working in terms of uh, milliampere, so in current. Uh, it, it's not a big deal if your neurologist knew it in advance, because we can actually see how much current the brain is receiving before we change the, the battery. So even you're getting you know, three volts and five volts on the other side, the neurologist interrogating the programmer can see how much current is delivered, takes the number uh, so down, it writes it down, and then when you have the new battery implanted, you, the neurologist will just insert those numbers in the new battery, and that will be enough. Thank you very much. Sue must have been asking that question at a certain moment in your presentation because she's asking, yeah. is this the Abvi product? I can't wait for this. Uh, yes. So first of all, I, I don't <laughs> like too many exclamation marks. Uh, uh, you know, you all, uh, of course, uh, we're all interested to use it, but too much excitement always means disappointment. So try to, you know, I understand that uh, can be useful, but uh, try to, 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 to be careful and wait for the data. Seems promising, um, and uh, the one I showed, yes, it is an AbbVie product, but there are other companies that are looking into it. Uh, another company is called Neuroderm, 
Um, so, you know, there's interest in delivering levodopa, but not more in the, not, no longer in the intestine, but under the skin or in, uh, in the derm, dermal uh, subministration. Thank you very much. So question from an anonymous attendee who is saying, so if my main issues among many are gait and balance, I likely would not qualify for DBS, question mark? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that's why I dedicated my PhD to gait and balance disorders, because our major determinants of patients' quality of life. Uh, and DBS not only doesn't help them often, but it also makes things worse. Um, but it depends, because if these problems are levodopa responsive, I will still consider this procedure, or even if they are not even responsive, but there are other problems, tremor or fluctuation and dyskinesia, you can still have a conversation with your neurologist and, and, uh, and decide what's gonna improve, what's not, and depending on what matters to you, you may still go for one of these procedures as, as long as you understand uh, what, uh, what uh, you're gonna get from it. Because we wanna hear the goal, and that's why I do this webinar, is to keep a good level of understanding of what we're talking about. Education is key, because from that, we, we become team, one team, and especially there's no disappointment after surgery. Absolutely. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, Nick is asking us whether there are any benefits to having an apomorphine infusion prior to DBS, or is it more a personal choice? And second part of his question, given that apomorphine is a dopamine agonist, does it come with the same potential side effects? Yeah, two good questions. And, and by the way, so there's also a question by Donna, if you want to really yes, discuss Yes, I was going to keep it for the end. It's a great question, oh, actually. I wanted to okay. stay on the topic first, and I, I released your answer to that one. Okay, okay. no, I, I, thought, I thought you didn't see it later. <laughs> um, um, sorry for moderating the moderator. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the question that Nick is asking, the two questions are very good questions. So uh, it is, you know, all we talk about it is a personal choice. Um, the other reason I discuss these things in length uh, is because you need to know what's on the table for you. Um, when I discuss these procedures with my patients, I, I always tell them what is available, not just what I think is good for them. Because some people will say, you know, I want to try something that doesn't require any major surgery. I just want to have a subcutaneous uh, needle. Um, so it, it is always a personal choice. But in reality, it's true that um, since over time, apomorphine becomes less tolerated. Uh, I mentioned also the issue of dyskinesias. Uh, it, it, and, but it's easy to start apomorphine. Some people say that this is not a parallel choice, but it's a serial choice. You go for apomorphine soon because it's easy to start. And then a few years later, when it's not tolerated anymore, you go for either DBS or Duodopa. We looked into it actually with a, with a colleague of mine in Italy. Uh, his name is Nicola Modugno. Uh, and uh, we looked at what happened to people after the apomorphine. And a lot of them went for DBS especially if they were young. A lot of them were for Dodopa, especially if they were, were middle age or a little older. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of them were only kept on oral medication. So they went backwards in a way. And that because they were too frail. So it's good to start from, uh, with epimorphine, but this should also, uh, sh this should not delay things too much because you might be in a situation at some point where epimorphine is no longer possible to be used yet the body is too frail to do anything else. Thank you. So Gerlinda is talking about her husband. Oh, actually, sorry, I forgot oh, sorry. to answer. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I forgot the second part. Yes, that's right. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. The, the, yes, it is a dopamine agonist, and as such, it can cause ICD, it can cause confusion. But really, the major problem with morphine as a dopamine agonist is low blood pressure, nausea and vomit, uh, mania uh, and also hypersexuality in some people. So these are the major, but being a dopamine agonist is for sure less tolerated than levodopa. That's, that's, that's for sure. Thank you, Alfonso. Gerlinda has a question concerning her husband who has Parkinson's, has had DBS since three years, but he now falls mm -hmm. very often and he has to walk with a rollator. As you can see, he's in, uh, in hospital with the bleeding in the center of the brain. And she's asking, can the DBS be adjusted so that he doesn't fall anymore? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your husband, uh, Gerlind, and, uh, um, and this is not a surprise to me. Uh, it's, um, if we look at trials of the, um, uh, DBS, we see that often, um, it, it often false frequency is increased after DBS. And there are two reasons to explain this. Uh, first, because people move more, they have a higher chance to fall. 
that's something that we should also keep in mind. But also DBS, as I mentioned in my presentation, especially when STN is the target, can make balance worse. And that comes from a variety of things, maybe wrong parameter, too much medication reduction, or even the fact that people get too impulsive. With DBS, sometimes people become reckless. So there are many different reasons why people might fall more. And in Toronto right now, I'm leading a, a randomized control trial, which is surprising, hasn't been done so far. The trial is basically comparing standard of care, which is DBS, versus DBS plus physiotherapy right after surgery. And we're seeing that people fall less. This is just to say that there is something that you guys need to always keep in mind, which is exercising. Physiotherapy, rehabilitation exercise is way more important than DBS, gloves, medications, whatever you want to do. Uh, so, the, And unfortunately, there's not much emphasis on this. Um, and DBS alone is never the answer. DBS can make things worse. And when it does, it's balanced. This is why you need to do other things. Now, as for there are certain things that can be adjusted uh, to help your, your husband's balance. It depends because it's a multifactorial process. For sure, if the balance problem is coming from freezing of gait, and if freezing of gait is worsened by DBS, lowering the frequency, which is what you're asking, uh, can help. Uh, in this case, we use either 60 or 80 hertz of stimulation. But again, this is something that your neurologist should be uh, in charge of. Thank you very much, Alfonso. Donna, actually, I will keep Donna's question on the glove for last, as I said, but there is another question from Donna concerning PEMF, and she basically asking whether you think that the therapy such as PEMF technology, which I'm not familiar with, uh, if it's basically a less invasive solution, what do you think about it? Are you familiar with it? Uh, don't know what exactly is, but I know that there are, and that, again, this goes back to all the things that you might find online and uh, that sounds always miracles. Uh, there are ways to stimulate the brain from afar. Um, this is possible with PMS, where uh, an electrical uh, magnetic field is used, uh, but there is also now uh, ways to bring electricity in the deep brain, again, without opening the skull. This is probably what she's referring to. And... I, the way I see these therapies uh, is that they can help us understand the brain. It, it can help us understand what parts of the brain needs to be stimulated. But the thing is that whatever you do is going to be transient unless you go around with this technology applied to, to your skull. Uh, so I think I see these technologies as a way to understand where to place the electrodes in the future. Uh, but I don't know exactly what that is. So my, my answer has okay. to be general. Uh, I can't really be specific. No I will insert a question of my own. I don't know if that piece of news made its way to Toronto, but in the UK recently, it was found that a hospital in Birmingham uh, basically had had a very poor performance at DBS. Uh, they found that actually to read that 22 cases between 2017 and 2019, they looked at those two, 22 cases and found that only one, only three of the electrodes were placed in good positions. Five were unusable and 13 were simply ineffective. Um, which also led to speech problems. I just wondered, as a patient, how can I make sure that I'm basically having the DBS operation if that's what I want to do at the right place in the right hands? That's absolutely a very important point. I, I'm aware of the situation. Uh, without necessarily sp speaking about the center, because there are, I don't know, the local reasons why this happened. But DBS is not like taking a pill. Because you, you might say, oh, levodopa didn't work for me. But it's, I know that if you take levodopa, in London, and you take Levodopa in, I don't know, Belfast, it's the same thing. DBS is not like taking a pill. It depends how it's done, where it is, how it's programmed, if you're the right candidate. Most of the success of DBS is in the candidate selection. Also then in where the electrode is placed and also how the post-operative management is done. So clearly it depends on the center. Um, there is a big publication done in the States, which is not very well recognized. Um, they looked at hundreds of hundreds of procedures, actually thousands of procedures, and they looked at predictors of success. And they found that a center to be successful doesn't have to be fancy things. They just need to do a lot of it. So the more your center does this yes. procedure, the better they are at doing it. And they found a critical number of 20 procedures per year. So if a center doesn't do more than 20 dbs new insertion a year is not an uh, 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 i don't want to say it's not a good center but it's not the best center for dbs let's put it this way that's a great so that's something thank you very much so yeah patients should ask their doctors okay how many procedures you do in a year uh to give you an idea in toronto we do 120 new procedure a year 
uh, and we are one of the biggest centers in the world. A good center will do between 20 and 30 procedures a year. From 30 on, you're you know, under the care of a, a leading center for sure. Excellent. That is great, great advice. Thank you very much. Quick question from Sue, which is really a tiny bit not on the topic of today specifically, but she basically says her PD is not tremor dominant. And how common is that? And what does it mean oh, for it, what we're talking it, about today? It is common. Um, probably tremor dominant PD is rare than non tremor uh, so compared to uh, you know cases like yours. Uh, so simply put, we we say the Parkinson's can be characterized uh, by three major phenotypes. Uh, but this is a very simplistic way to look at things. Tremor dominant when there is basically mainly tremor. Uh, mixed when there's tremor, but also slowness and rigidity, and then rigid akinetic when there is no tremor at all. Uh, so of the three, the tremor dominance is the rarest, followed by the mixed, followed by the rigid. Uh, so the, the, the most common is the mixed, followed by the rigid akinetic, followed by the tremor dominant. It doesn't necessarily change things, uh, but uh, the management can be a little different depending on other accompanying factors. Um, but uh, you know, for the sake of time, I won't discuss today. But to answer your question, you are not alone. It's quite common when you have. Thank you, Alfonso. So let's go to Donna's question, actually. We have all heard about that famous vibration glove being developed by uh, Dr. Peter Tass at Stanford University. Uh, what do you yeah. think about it? And Mark has actually piled in and he basically asked your, your thoughts about vibrotactile stimulation generally. Which is the same thing, basically. Um, okay, so many thoughts. Uh, in short, I would say, hold, don't hold your breath. Um, you need to wait and see what happens. Um, people don't, I know the technology. Um, actually, I was in a meeting with Peter Tass uh, and he described this uh, new approach uh, to us. And what people don't re recognize is where Peter, Peter Tass is coming from. Peter Tass has been the inventor of a very interesting technology called coordinated reset, which is basically stimulating the subthalamic nucleus. So it's DBS procedure in a ra random or seemingly random fashion. So stimulating here and there in, in the subthalamus. So he's tried to replicate the same phenomenon that is seen with DBS stimulating the hand. But this has been done in few patients with a device that is quite expensive. He told me that it's seven thousand uh, dollars for a few you know, weeks, and more importantly, without placebo control. So anytime we do something, we are all um, sensitive to placebo, and it's difficult to have a real placebo because obviously, because of the way it works, when when you are under the effect of the treatment, you feel the vibration. Uh, so it's difficult to do a trial where you can do a, a part of the uh, of the trial what we call arm uh, a sham control or a placebo arm so that you can really see how much is placebo how much is the real effect. So it's difficult for me to say, uh, uh, you know, if it's going to work or not. I, I'm sure that there is a lot of placebo effect, not because this is what's happening here. It's simply because anything we do in Parkinson uh, has placebo effect everything. Uh, placebo is huge and placebo works increasing the amount of dopamine in the brain. That's why it is so powerful in, in, in Parkinson's. So be careful. Be careful before judging, before jumping onto something. Make sure that there are randomized controlled trials. Make sure that it's used by many people. Make sure that they don't charge you thousands and thousands of dollars. Some companies, there are unfortunately a lot of scammers on the internet. What they will do is letting you use their device for free for a month. And if you're happy, you buy it. But in one month, you don't you are not getting rid of the placebo effect. We know that placebo in Parkinson's can last up to 18 months. And we know that because in, in a study done in the past, they were doing sham surgery. Sham surgery means pretending to do the operation, opening, general anesthesia, all of it in a group of patients. In another group, they were inserting stem cells. And some people in the sham surgery group did better, a lot better for 18 months without having received any stem cell. So be careful. Uh, it's too early to answer the, the question of um, the glove in particular. I told you a little bit of background story there. Uh, Peter Tass has worked a lot on, on this topic. So it's certainly a, a respectable scientist and I have no reason to, to, to uh, not follow uh, with interest what he's doing. But the problem is that the news won't give you all these details. 
and they want to sell paper. They want to sell, you know, websites, mm -hmm. click, and they want to make it look always like it's the final answer to everything. But unfortunately, it doesn't look like it is. Um, the other thing I want you to be aware of is that uh, the same hype was a long time ago, a long time, two years ago, for spinal cord stimulation. Spinal cord stimulation actually works on the somato, somat, somatosensory system. So same approach. And they also done, uh, done animal studies showing that when there's spinal stimulation going on that causes paresthesia in the body, the brain changes response. Yeah, that's all true because the brain is there to perceive the, the, the vibration, but that doesn't always translate into a, a clinical improvement beyond the placebo effect. So I hope that I give you some answers, which in short is be careful and wait for major studies to be published. Thank you, Alfonso, for those words of caution. Thank you also for a great presentation, for spending the time to answer your, your questions today. Uh, I'm very grateful. Thank you so much. I know you have patients waiting for you, so we are finishing yes. on time. Before everyone hangs up, I just wanted to say, please make a note in your diaries that our next session will be taking place on the 10th of January, 7.30 p.m. London time. And the speaker will be Dr. Simon Stott, who is the head of research at Cure Parkinson's. Um, I think you know Simon, probably. Alfonso. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, happy to, uh, to be followed by him <laughs> <laughs> he will be talking to us about uh, his PD research takeaways for for this year 2022 as well as which research he will be looking for and looking at in 2023 so thank you so much for your for, for your participation today to you Alfonso and to everyone who joined us and Merry Christmas to everyone thank you so much thank you happy holiday everyone bye bye, bye, -bye.